Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. Mahesh Thapa joining us again. Mahesh, what's going on, man? Nothing much. Glad to be back. It's uh, like I was going through withdrawal. It's been a month since I've been back. <laughs> Has it been a month already? Wow. It feels I know, like it was literally it. just last month, week. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, hey, we made it. Time flies when you don't have Mahesh on the air, but we got you right, back. Right. Today we're talking uh, travel. We're talking gear. So everybody out there, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us on our main Facebook page, as well as Vimeo and, of course, here on Zoom. Um, get a notepad, get your pens. If you got your little notepad app on your phone, get it ready. Mahesh is going to be dropping dimes as usual, but we're going to be talking about gear today, gear specifically for travel. So we're going to be dropping links into the comment section and the chat here on Zoom, but get your notepads ready. We have Alpha Collective member Mahesh Thapa. So I want to, of course, thank Sony for sponsoring today's event. Got a lot to get into, so get your questions in and I'm going to turn it over to Mahesh. All right. Thanks, Derek. Uh, great to be back. And uh, <laughs> this time I have the, the lettering all correct now. Last time it was all backwards, but I think we got that fixed. Uh, I tried to sort of outsmart myself with the, by putting it backwards to begin with anyway. So that's, that's, that's another story. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, gear for travel landscape photography. So most of it is going to be gear, the equipment I take, uh, some advice I have. And, um, and I also consider apps that I use all the time as essential gear, because without that, uh, much of what we do for social media and for editing and things like that, it just, um, you know, just sort of fall by the wayside. So it's just not just physical equipment, but also uh, apps and programs. I think it'll be helpful for you guys. And finally, I'm going to end with just a few quote unquote rules that we all need to be reminded of as far as uh, landscape photography, composition, uh, you know, lighting, things like that, to, to just keep in the back of my mind. It never hurts to have a little refresher, not too much time, but I think uh, I think a little refresher there will help. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to share my screen, which is, I'm going to, this is going to be a little different. It's going to be partly slideshow and uh, partly sort of talking head like this. Uh, I think uh, it'll allow for a little bit more engagement and, uh, and I will focus in on the equipment when necessary by getting out of the slideshow so you can see it in a and a bigger screen, and hopefully that'll help. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Uh, so again, my name is Mahesh Thapa. Uh, my Instagram account, Starving Photographer. Uh, I am a Sony Alpha ambassador, so uh, that's sort of my uh, uh, disclosure, if you will. Uh, and all images that I show here today were taken on a Sony camera of some sort. Uh, what specific camera? I'm not, I'm not sure what lens, but it was all on a Sony system. So, you know, my background is, in education. Uh, and with most presentations, I like to have a few objectives that are achievable for you guys by the end of the presentation. Uh, and so these are the ones that I think are the most important. You know, you should appreciate the balance uh, of equipment, comfort, and creativity, what I like to call the travel triangle, if you will. So we have the exposure triangle, but we also have what I've coined the travel triangle. And we'll focus on a little bit on that. You know, I'm going to talk about various apps, but if you could just Two, if you could focus on two that you like very much, try it out, give it a try. Uh, I think most of them are actually free uh, and you probably already use, but maybe not in the way that, that I sort of use it. So check that out uh, and apply. I'm gonna talk about various rules of composition, learn to apply three of them. If you haven't already, you know, just keep that in mind. And, you know, essentially become a better travel landscape photographer, hopefully by, by the end of the session or, or get on your way to doing that. I always say, you know, people take pictures while they're traveling. I mean, that's what you do, right? You travel, you take pictures, you have your camera with you, but try to turn that around and try to be a person who travels to take picture. Just that mindset change, I think, will really allow you to view the world differently as you're going around. Not even, you know, it doesn't have to be like a world traveling. It could be your neighborhood. It could be in your city in your state, your, your country, uh, if you sort of say, you know what, I'm my express purpose of doing this journey is to take really good pictures. You, you think a certain way, you look at objects a certain way, you look for the right light, you see compositions that you didn't see before uh, because your mindset is different. I really, I really believe in that. So we're gonna get to the equipment right away, okay? This was taken five years ago and uh, I made this little Instagram post about you know what I use 
when I travel, particularly if I want to travel with the focus of landscape. Some of the things have changed, and I'll discuss that, but many of the things have remained the same. Maybe it's been updated, uh, uh, you know, replaced by some other uh, gear that does something better or something equivalent, but maybe it's lighter. So again, it's all about comfort, expectations, and what you want to achieve as you're traveling. So let's just go through this real quick. Uh, the two cameras I used to take were the Sony a7R uh, Mark III and the RX10 Mark IV. And I'll give you reasoning behind why. I didn't really want to change lenses, especially when I was sort of out in the environment. And I wanted a nice big focal range. I wanted, an, I wanted to capture the ultra wide uh, and try to get as much resolution as possible. That's why I put the 16 to 35 uh, and I took an F4 lens, right? I didn't even take an F2.8 uh, because you know, the resolution and the noise profile was so good and it was a little bit lighter, the, the, the F4 versus the F2.8. Uh, A7R3 you know, had plenty of resolution at that time. I took the RX10 Mark IV because it's got an incredibly versatile zoom range. It goes from like 24 to I think 400 or 600, I forget now, uh, a millimeter equivalent. Uh, with a very, very bright lens. And it was really, it was weather sealed. It was ergonomically really nice to use. And between those two camera and lens systems, I pretty much was able to cover whatever I needed to cover. Uh, I took a little action cam, like a GoPro. My, that my, I had a little Gitzo tripod. That was a travel tripod, very lightweight. It folded nicely. A remote shutter, uh, various polarizers, ND filters, extra batteries and chargers, headlamp and my MacBook Pro. So what's changed in the last five years, okay? So I've upgraded my gear just a little bit. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you my bag that basically this is what I go on the airplane with. So I'm going to get out of this and unshare my screen. So you can actually see me uh, as, as, a, as a bigger bigger image. So this is what I actually go on the plane with. Um, everything I need to carry is in this bag. This is not necessarily what I carry when I'm at the location going for a hike or, 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 or walking about town, but what I put in my backpack and I walk on the plane with is all in this bag. And it looks a little, little heavy, uh, but, and I'm gonna show you exactly how heavy it is. So as I look at this, you probably can't see it, but this says 20 pounds. So in 20 pounds worth of gear, uh, again, you have to decide what you can live with as far as the weight. Uh, I have everything that I need in this bag. This bag is made by MindShift. It's called the Rotation. Uh, I talked about this on my last talk where I talked about water flow uh, photography. It's still the same backpack because I think it's awesome. I've been using it for many, many years and it hasn't failed me. So let's see exactly how I put stuff in this bag. At the very front, I carry a tripod. Now that tripod is no longer the Gitzo 1541. Uh, the Gitzo 1540 is still a great tripod, but I love this new one that I have strictly because it comes with a leveling base, which is this thing right here. The leveling base is pretty awesome. You can make minor adjustments when you're on a hill or on, um, or on terrain that's not so even. It's made by a company called Leo Photo, L-E-O-F-O-T-O. -O -O. Uh, and this is, the, this is the brand, this is the Ranger. Uh, it's called LS255CEX. And it's still very compact and it's still very lightweight. But again, the big thing is that leveling base right over here that I can make adjustments with. The ball head I'm using is from Really Right Stuff. Again, look how beat up that is. I mean, it's taken a licking and it keeps on ticking, no problems. I love the quick release over here. Uh, it's no, no more fundling with little knobs, you know, making sure that it's not quite tight. Because I often carry my gear like this on my shoulder. And if I have a knob, sometimes I forget to tighten that quite right. Uh, and uh, haven't yet, but almost it's sort of fallen out. But with this quick release little, little tab here, it, it never is an issue. It never had a problem. And I also like the fact that there's only one uh, knob here to change all types of motions. Okay, so I really like that feature. Very, very lightweight, very, very compact. I really recommend this, this tripod. The Gitzo is great too, but you know, it's, I think, three times the price and you don't really need it. This is also carbon fiber, about the same weight. Okay, so 
So let me go to the top compartment here and show you what I carry there. I carry, again, same thing as I see show in the video, my set of filters. The camera I'm using now is the a7R4 with the 1635 f2.8 lens now. I switched to the f2.8 because I often am doing a lot more astrophotography now. And the a7R4 has a higher megapixel count. So it, it, it is really, really great for everything except noise profile. Just to be honest, it's not quite as noise friendly at the higher ISO as the a7R3 was because the a7R3 is a lower megapixel count. So given the same full frame size, the density of pixels on the a7R4 is a little, uh, little higher. So it's a little noisier at the uh, higher ISO. Therefore, I instead of taking the 1635 f4 lens, now I've switched over to the 1635 f2.8 G master lens. That takes 82 millimeter filters. And instead of the RX10 Mark IV, I am taking the Sony a7C. It's a little wonder. I'm going to let me just show you those two. So this is the Sony a7C. And I'm doing a lot more video nowadays, particularly on location. And I need a second camera body as a backup. The one problem I had with the prior setup was that if one camera broke down, I no longer had access to that set of lens. And not, not that I did, but I was always, I always have angst. Now, if I have two alpha bodies that are full frame, God forbid, if one of them doesn't work, the other one serves as a nice backup. And they both take the same uh, lens mount. So the 1635 can go on the uh, a7R4 and the, and the other lens I carry is the 24 to 105 F4. Um, I still need F4 for that focal range is just fine because most of the times I'm not taking astro images with that lens. I'm taking low light astro stuff uh, with, with this lens, 1635. So this camera lens and this camera lens. So this is the A7R4 body with the 24 to 105 F4. So those two, again, I'm not changing lenses anymore. Those two serve all my purposes. Now you may be saying, well, you know, the RX10 Mark IV give you 400 millimeter range. But if you notice the A7R4 has 60 megapixels, if you crop that down 50%, that gives you 200 millimeter equivalent. If you crop that down to 15 megapixels, which is very similar to the megapixel count of the RX10 Mark IV, you know, that gives you 400 millimeters. So I'm not really sacrificing even focal length with those two cameras and lens systems. Uh, and you get the benefit of a full frame sensor uh, as opposed to a one inch sensor uh, that we have on the RX10 Mark IV. So that's the camera equipment that I, I typically take. So those filters I was talking about, I have 82 millimeter filters in here uh, with polarizer, ND filter, adapter rings to adapt from 82 millimeter size to 77 millimeter size. So I can just take one set of filters. Uh, the brand of filters I like to use, if anybody cares, is Breakthrough Photography. Uh, they're very, very well made, they're brass, uh, they tend not to stick together uh, like some of the other filters that I've used if I had to stack filters. Um, and so I think those are really great. I want to focus in on one particular filter that I think you guys may be interested in. And they make this in the three-stop variant and the six-stop variant. And this is it right here. And if you notice, this is an ND filter, but it twists. Why is that twist? Because it has a polarizer built in. Uh, it's infrequent that I don't use a polarizer on, on my shots, particularly when I'm outside. And I also wanna put an ND filter. Now I no longer have to stack those filters. I can put a single filter on that has both a polarizing effect and an ND effect. So I think that's, that's really key. Other brands also make that, and I think they're also good, but that's just the one I happen to use uh, is the one from Breakthrough Photography. I think it comes in uh, three stops and six stop variants. Uh, I don't think it's yet available at the 10 stop or the 15 stop, but by the time you get to that much light inhibition, the polarizer really isn't doing very much. Um, so maybe that's why they don't make it in those variations. And I also carry just a regular straight up polarizer where I don't want to have such a, a big ND filter because the polarizer itself, uh, you remember, has about one and a half to two stops 
uh, of light inhibition. So that's sort of a built into polarizer. So those are the filters like there. Let me put this. Um, and again, this, this, this A7C is mainly uh, not only as a backup, but for my video work. I love this for video work because this is the only full frame camera that I have where the screen actually flips out. So I can do a lot of talking head and selfie type, uh, type of videos. I really, really like that. Uh, okay. As I'm looking at the rest of my bag, this is our rain gear that came with the bag. Okay, this is some yellow automotive towels. Uh, this is great for absorbing water. It's so much better than those little lens cloths that you get because it's super absorbent and you can, uh, and you can clean off a lot of things and it doesn't leave any filmy residue and does a great job of picking up any excess water. And two extra batteries, right? If you look at, if you remember what I showed in my last slide, I had like seven batteries because my RX10 Mark IV took the smaller brand of Sony batteries and they used to die in like forever. Now, both cameras take the same batteries so I don't have to carry two different types of batteries and they last forever. So all I need is two extra batteries most of the time. And that's my top compartment. So on the second compartment, is where I keep some of the other essential gear that I have. I now take an iPad. I have the iPad Pro, so that's replaced my MacBook Pro. It, this iPad Pro comes with an M1 processor, so it's actually faster than my old MacBook Pro from, from five years ago. Uh, I love the touch screen. I love the able, being able to use the pencil, Apple Pencil, to make all my edits, making fine touches, and a lot of the apps. Uh, and for video and photography are really optimized for the system and it weighs less and it's more compact. Uh, and I have the magic, uh, magic keyboard attached to it, Apple magic keyboard. So it has a built-in trackpad. So I really have no issues whatsoever. I got the one terabyte version. Uh, so I don't have a lot of issues as far as storage either. So most of the images I take get stored right onto this device. I love the fact that it has a USB-C connector now, uh, and it's not just USB-C, but it's Thunderbolt. So you can attach Thunderbolt drives if you needed to. So that has replaced my MacBook Pro. And all I do is carry the small charger. So if you notice all my gear takes USB-C as a charging, my iPad Pro, is charged by USB-C. The Sony A7R4 is charged by USB-C. The A7C is USB-C. I have a headlamp, that's USB-C. I have a portable charger, a power bank, that's USB-C. And so now all I do is carry this one little device. It could, you could use anything really. This is, a, this is made by a company called Aukey, A-U-K-E-Y, but any kind of um, a charger uh, or, or, uh, or a plug, that has two USB-C outlets is fine. And uh, look how tiny it is. It's much smaller than any charger that I have to take for a MacBook Pro or all the other stuff. And because it's all USB-C, I only have to take one, uh, one, one cord or two cords if I wanna use both outlets over here. And the wires from before. And this is the headlamp that I like to use which I find to be very, very helpful because it has an auto dimming feature. I don't know if you, uh, b sells this. I got this, uh, I don't know where I got this, but it's made by a company called Petzl, P-E-T-Z-L. Uh, I like the bright orange. It has three levels of light and it has an extra light and a sensor. So if the ambient light becomes darker or brighter, it adjusts uh, to that. So the battery life on this lasts a long time and it's rechargeable, like I said. So I really like that for my headlamp. Umbrella, always need an umbrella, very, very lightweight. Uh, can be any brand, really. This is my other thing that I take now that I didn't should take before. This is the Sony microphone. It's my favorite microphone by far of all the ones I've had. It's a shotgun type. It goes directly on top 
of my Sony cameras, and it's made by Sony, and it's called the uh, ECM B1M. And what's great, it's purely digital. So there's no analog conversion. So the, the sound is really great. It's got different modes uh, for you to pick up the sound, cardiac, uh, omnidirectional, um, and, and what have you. And you can make all the adjustments. Uh, I'm not much of an audiophile or a video geek, but this makes me sound like I know exactly what I'm doing. So I really like that. I put that basically on my A7 uh, C and do most of my videos that way. That's, that's become an essential gear for me as far as when I travel. And, and you know, that's pretty much it. I have a couple other things like, like toilet paper. I always carry toilet paper with me because you never know by degradable. Uh, a little cover. This is a peak design cover for my camera. Sometimes I carry the camera on a peak design plate right on my shoulder on the strap. Uh, and this goes directly on top of the camera. Uh, it sort of fits in like through here and it protects it from the rain. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. So all of that ends up being about 20 pounds. Now, when I get to my location, I'm not gonna carry my iPad. I'm not gonna you know, carry um, all the other chargers and cords. So I, when I'm actually walking around, it comes down to about 15 pounds. And I think 15 pounds uh, is pretty doable, uh, especially since you're carrying two bodies, uh, two versatile lenses and a tripod uh, and a couple of batteries. So that, that's really great. So let's get back to the presentation. Okay, so as you can see, this is what I used to carry and you see what's been replaced now. So again, try to keep this triangle uh, in, in, in mind. What are your expectations? What do you hope to achieve with your photography? Are you trying to get world-class images? Uh, are you doing this for publication? Is this your job? Uh, so that's gonna change uh, how much you are willing to carry. You know, maybe you're a little older, maybe you have health issues, uh, or maybe you just don't want to be very comfortable. So you have to consider that. And, you know, a lot of times you're limited as far as space and what can you take on a carry on? Uh, what, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of bag do you have? How much space do you have? All those things factor into what you eventually end up deciding. After years of doing this, this is what I ended up sort of filtering everything down to. It lets me get really high quality images. Uh, I'm comfortable carrying that weight on my back. Uh, and it's just the right amount of space with a little bit extra if I need to carry a jacket uh, or uh, some food or what have you. So I'll give you an example of sort of the versatility. I talked to you about you know, carrying that 24 to a one or five millimeter lens made by Sony, the F4. So this is the 24 millimeter perspective, okay? And so this is the 400 millimeter equivalent perspective. So all I just, all I did was take it at 105 millimeters, uh, crop down to 50% gives you 200 millimeters, 50% more gives you uh, 400 millimeters. So this is about a 15, 16 megapixel image uh, equivalent at 400 millimeters. This is equivalent to 24 natively. So this I published, you know, printed out 12 by 13 size, uh, 12 by 18, whatever. Uh, and it still looks really, really good. So, you know, you don't need a large megapixel count when you're zoomed in for certain types of shots. The fact that you have a large megapixel camera like an A7R4 allows you to do this kind of cropping and still get very compelling images. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some apps that I really, really like. And these are apps probably you know about already. In fact, you probably, you, I, I guarantee you know about these, some of these apps already, but maybe you're not using it uh, for your traveling as, as I do. Um, let me know uh, later on in the comments or whatever when we get to Facebook to see uh, how you're using these apps, and if there are any other apps that I should be considering uh, that I'm not. The first one is simple Google Maps. Uh, we all use it. Uh, some people use Apple Maps, but I think Google, Google Maps is really, really great. Uh, and, what I, and this is how I typically use it. I'm going to show you a little video where I planned a trip based on um, where I was going to Sydney, Australia. So, you know, I just did a search for Sydney, and then I went to the area. And then I went to offline areas, custom areas. So this actually lets you 
choose what size of the map you want to have downloaded onto your uh, onto your device. So if you don't have cellular service uh, or you're in another country and you want to buy cellular service, all this information is still ready. So it downloads the information onto your uh, computer or your or your phone, and you can update it, you know, in 30 days. So just I typically downloaded a, a few days or a, a week or so before I have to go somewhere. And then at the very end, I just hit the update button. Everything is taken care of. And now I'm carrying this very, very, very detailed area of wherever I'm going with driving instructions because you have GPS built into your phone. And this is all in Google Maps. And I have several maps stored. Uh, and every so often I'll go in and update it uh, depending on what type of traveling I'm doing. So I don't know if you're using Google Maps in that way, but I think it's a really, really uh, a great way of doing it. Instagram. So Instagram is a great way of sharing information, but it's also a really great way, I think, of researching where you want to go. And when you get there, what are some of the cool spots? Because oftentimes uh, cities themselves have Instagram accounts. So again, I'm going to use Sydney as an example. Uh, I'm going to. So what I did was I went to uh, my Instagram account and I did a search to look for what images I wanted to take while I was in Sydney. So I just you know, typed in uh, Sydney as the in, in the search engine, uh, and then I got their official Australia site, and I sort of went down and said, "Oh, this is a really cool perspective. I wonder where this is taken from." For example, this uh, this view is from the Queen Victoria building. I never would have thought to even go there uh, had I not seen an image. Now I know exactly where to go. Uh, again, you're not copying images, but you're getting ideas. You know about where to go, how to get there, and where's this view of the opera taken care of? You know, this was gotten from the Sydney Harbor Bridge. So that said, oh, when I'm there, I want to go on the tour where I can go to the top of the Sydney uh, Harbor Bridge. Uh, here's another one taken from uh, Watson Bay. I never would have thought about going there. Not to say that this is the composition I love, but I love the perspective on the city. Again, all based on a little search. This one, I frankly, just stole the composition because I thought it was so great. <laughs> so I went to this, this, this place. Uh, it says hidden harborside cafes and stunning vistas, right? So again, you probably never would have found this place otherwise. And even if you go to popular sites like uh, 500 Picks or do a Google search, you're not going to get the uh, intimate views or some different perspectives that, that some of these places are um, uh, allow you to get. So using Instagram as a way of searching for places to go before you get there, uh, local venues is I think a great way to use the app. Uh, Photo Pills, this is probably my favorite app when I plan about sunrise, sunset shots, Milky Way shots, uh, and a lot of people use this. It's a little complicated, so it takes a little while to get used to, but once you learn how to use it, it completely invaluable. It knows, I know exactly when to go. It tells me, you know, where the galactic core is going to be, when it's going to rise. The little gray lines here tell me when it's going to rise and when it's going to set, uh, what the blue hour is, what the golden hour is, moonrise, moonset, everything. And I can even say, okay, I'll put a pin here. This is the direction I'll be looking. What's my view and how do I actually plan my shot to get there? So as you can see, it's not just all about physical equipment. It's the apps that you have with you uh, that really allow you to get some uh, amazing shots. Here's one I've been using for years, and it's a very simple app. It's called Long EXP, basically long exposure. And it allows you to uh, calculate what your shutter speed, aperture, ISO should be based on what you want to capture and what type of filters you're using. So for example, uh, let's say I want to, uh, you know, get a, 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 a long exposure shot. If my uh, camera says 1 15th of a second without, without a filter and I want to go to 20 seconds, I know I have to put a 10 stop filter on to get that 20 second effect. So that's just one use case for this. Uh, another use case is to, when I shoot Milky Ways, you sort of get used to do this, but if you're not used to shooting the Milky Way, this is a great tool because it figures out everything for you. You don't have to learn anything called the 500 rule and you know what do you do as far as crop factor. I'm using an APS-C sensor camera or I'm using a, a one-inch sensor camera. 
what are the, how are those values different based on what I'm shooting with? This actually calculates it for you. It tells you what the target exposure value should be to get this sort of nighttime look. It's a minus uh, seven EV. And you can play around with the parameters, the ISO, the f-stop, uh, the, uh, the focal length, and what crop factor you have to get it as close to that minus seven EV as you can. Uh, and that'll give you, quote unquote, the perfect Milky Way shot with still stars. So this is not for trails, but pinpoint stars. And this is a great way of doing it, I think. So you get an idea of what, what this app does. Another aspect I really like about this app is you can just use it as a little chart. It's got this nice built-in chart about ND filters. You can say, okay, uh, if I have a eighth of a second and I want, and I put a three-stop filter, what's the shutter speed should be? If I put a six-stop filter, what should the shutter be? 10-stop. And you can choose any stop you want, and it gives you a nice little cheat sheet about how you should uh, uh, handle it. Okay, so that's long EXP. And finally, this is just a fun app, but it's become a lot more useful in the recent years with some updates and it's called Starwalk. It's called, I think it's Starwalk 2 now, but basically it, when I'm at, out at night, it lets me visualize the constellations by just pointing it up at the sky. But not only that, now I know exactly where the Milky Way is gonna rise while I'm at that situation, where I'm at, um, at the venue. And I say, oh, right now this, the Milky Way is actually below the horizon. So I can now, put in the date, the time, and then I can actually follow it with my phone on the sky and say, okay, where's it gonna be You know, at one o'clock in the morning? Is it gonna be over here? It's gonna be over there. I like the PhotoPills app to plan out generalities for when I have to be there. But when I actually get to the location, I use Starwalks to say, okay, this is exactly where it's gonna uh, 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 align with. And I can make that composition just the way I want uh, with those two applications. So I really like those two. Okay, so those are the essential apps that I, that I like to use. Uh, and before I get to some other um, equipment that I think is also good, I'm just gonna briefly talk to you about some of the rules that I sort of try to keep in the back of my mind uh, when I'm traveling. Uh, first and foremost, know your equipment, right? I mean, so many times people buy new equipment to go on a trip and when they get on a trip, they got that great moment. They don't know how to use it because they haven't really played around with it before they got where they went there. So, so really it helps. It sounds like a no-brainer, obvious, but I can't tell you how many times, uh, even in workshops, that people come in with this great equipment, but they have no idea how to use it. Uh, bring a sturdy tripod, remote release. You sort of saw that on the back. I'd rather carry one less lens or one less camera body than forget a tripod because oftentimes for landscape travel, you're doing low light photography and low light photography and long exposure photography means uh, you're going to have the shutter open for a long time. And there's no way you can handhold that kind of stuff or even use any type of image stabilization for such long exposure. So a tripod is really great. Remote release is great. So you don't have to touch the camera at all. So no vibrations whatsoever. Investigate the weather conditions before going there. Uh, you know, don't go a place in wintertime when you know it's going to be snowed out, right? So know what's going on before you get there. Just simple rules of third. You know, as you keep this in the back of your mind, you will start seeing in rules of thirds. You'll start seeing in spirals, you know, what objects. Your eye will instinctively say, okay, I need to pay the, place the camera here if I want this particular type of shot to look good compositionally. Uh, you know, as you're on the boat, like, oh, you know, where do I place this boat so that everything looks great? I mean, what I say is you have to know the rules before you can break them. You know, if you just randomly just take a picture uh, without knowing the rules, you may just get lucky. It's know the rules and choose to break the rules for the type of image, type of feeling you're going for, but know what they are nevertheless. So I think, I think this sort of points, I think this would be a much less compelling image uh, if the boat was centered uh, and I had a lot of water and very little of those uh, misty hills. And it doesn't just, not just landscape photography, you know, it applies for wildlife photography too. You know, if I, had, if I had put this animal on the right side of the screen, it would have been much less compelling because he'd be looking out of the screen and you start to wonder what the heck is he looking at? Here, you're exactly sort of, he's turned towards the, you leave all that space towards the side that the animal is looking at. 
again, rules of thirds. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, the whales at the bottom third. The horizon isn't uh, isn't is, is kind of centered, but it's okay because I think the foreground and the background are equally interesting. Uh, don't place the horizon directly at the center. If you can, try to use uh, that sort of rule of thirds again. Uh, similarly, over here, a couple of uh, uh, turtles uh, and even that little flying bird, it's sort of positioned such that the sun is in the upper right third, the turtles on the lower left third, horizon is the upper third. Uh, similarly, over here, uh, again, rule of thirds really comes into play. Uh, more over here where I think the sky was more interesting than the foreground. Here, uh, again, rules of thirds. You, 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 you don't realize how often you use this um, when, you're, when you're taking images in landscape because it becomes almost second nature. It just is a very, very pleasing way to compose. Uh, one notable exception is when you have reflections, I think. When you have reflections where the foreground and background are equally uh, important or equally impressive, I think it's, it's, it's fine to use uh, a 50-50 sort of composition, uh, similar you see over here. Whenever possible, use leading lines and S-shaped curves, right? Uh, that really leads uh, your viewer into, into the shot. Just realize that you know, when you're traveling, you know, these rules still apply. You can't forget about them. Uh, similarly over here, leading lines leading you to the subject. Again, here, there's sort of a crevasse uh, with a long exposure shot, but again, the eyes naturally go, they almost, they wanna skip on top of those stones or glide on that long exposure water out to the distance uh, onto the city. Uh, here uh, on top of a mountain, it's the leading lines as you follow it, you can actually see there's a little person over there sort of exclaiming that the, hey, they made it to the top, but the composition leads you further out into the rest, uh, rest of the view. Uh, you say, well, where are the leading lines? Where it's the, the stones themselves here serve as sort of dots and dashes out to the distance. Look for these natural frames to surround your subject matter, right? Here's this interesting rock formation uh, that sort of cups the top of the head. Uh, this is in Sydney again, uh, where we went inside. Again, this is this is not some exotic place that you that you want to. You're just you're walking out in the street and you're looking around and you say, "Oh, I could have just walked out, taken a picture of the Sydney Harbor, uh, the theater." But you step back, you start seeing these compositions, and you start seeing these frames, rules of thirds, reflections, uh, and you have to have that mindset in order to get to that type of uh, imagery. Again, uh, you sort of step back and say, oh, you know what? I can use this bush or this tree uh, as a frame to, uh, to, to, sub, to, to frame the Ayers rock. But not only that, if you notice, none of these trees are actually overlapping. So you start noticing little details like that. Uh, the, you see three prominent trees, but a step to the left, a step to the right, and you've got overlap and it sort of isn't as pleasing in composition uh, and there is that one or two perfect place that you can stand to get exactly uh, the image that you're looking for and you don't have to regret it later on. Uh, again, in landscape, the rule in general is you need a nice foreground, something interesting in the midground and a background. So even if you are just taking a simple picture of a stream, you know, find like a prominent rock or a colorful rock or use the polarizer to look deep into the water in a shallow surface so the, the foreground has interesting rocks that come out uh, that, that doesn't have any glare and use that as your foreground interest. Uh, if you're traveling with somebody, let them be the foreground, right? Here, it doesn't necessarily have to be any object. Somebody sitting in the foreground, you've got the leading lines, you have you rules of third, you got something interesting in the midground, uh, this sort of pagoda, uh, and the background is the sky and the and the, and the Ferris wheel. Uh, similarly, here this is just uh, some some coral, uh, but the long exposure has really blurred out the water in the distance, so it gives it that nice mid. The midground is some nice and sleek, uh, and the and the background is, are these interesting clouds. Again, all of this is with one of the two lenses that I mentioned before. The best light, remember it's early morning or late afternoon, but you can make some compelling images in the daytime with creative use of filters and uh, relying on good composition. Uh, here again, 
you may not notice, but there are two people there in the midground in the in the bush, sort of looking at Ayers Rock. Uh, again, you know, it's not always about colors that pop. You know, drama can be really well illustrated with uh, black and white photography and uh, and contrast uh, and textures. Uh, and don't forget about the human element, right? You're probably traveling with, with, with family and friends, you know, incorporate them into the picture if you can. Uh, you'll have better memories years later, you know. 30 years later, the picture with your wife in it is going to mean a lot more than that landscape picture with nobody in it. Uh, again, you know, it's a beautiful sunset, but I think it becomes even more, more pleasing with, with a human element. Like, whether it's just a couple of toes or your feet sticking out uh, in, the, in the kayak uh, makes, makes a big difference. Uh, experiment with ND filters. You're carrying polarizer and ND filters uh, and what have you. Uh, and then, you know, a simple boring shot becomes really interesting if you, if you, if you use uh, NDs and if you have, if you're shooting the daytime, you can, and you have nice clouds, you can really blur them out and go for a really interesting feel. Uh, here, this was taken in midday, uh, but the use of a very strong ND filter really gives it a, a dramatic, uh, dramatic look with these uh, charismatic clouds and these, uh, these gnarly rock formations. So like, in summary, really, before you go, know what equipment you're carrying, investigate the weather conditions before getting there, uh, and be familiar with some of the rules we talked about, you know, rule of thirds, leading lines, uh, you know, shooting at the right time of day, and if you're not, creative use of filters. That uh, really, uh, really makes a difference. Uh, don't forget the human element, uh, and download a few apps that I talked about. Maybe there are other apps that you can share with us that you think are great. That's also very helpful. And you know, it's travel, it's, it should be fun, and especially with this uh, pandemic, hopefully it's sort of coming to an end and we can do more traveling now. And this is what you should be able to do. Uh, and it really, you, you have to have this mindset that when you're traveling, you're doing it for the purpose of taking great pictures. Just having that mindset, I, I sort of, I'm being the dead horse, that mindset will, will allow you to create some amazing images from just simple scenes really oftentimes. Okay, so this is the information. And if you have any questions, comments, uh, don't hesitate to reach out either through my website, my email, or even on Instagram. I reply to direct messages there uh, quite frequently. So to, before we end, I'm going to go back to my talking head and uh, stop sharing. You should see me now. Okay. Uh, and just discuss, you know, a couple of other things that you may not think about. The other day, uh, you know, my, I, was, I was going through a field and I got, my jacket got stuck on a thorn and it ripped my jacket, which I've loved, had for years. And I was out on the market for a new jacket. Uh, and then just so happens, my wife sent me this article that CNN had just done on the waterproof jackets. And I always had problems with waterproof jackets because it never used to be waterproof at the zippers, no matter how good the jacket was, how expensive the jacket was, the zippers always somehow seemed to get wet. So I read this article and I think uh, that that link is being shared with you right now. And uh, it, it, the number one jacket that they recommended is the one I got. They give you a choice of four or five or six jackets. Uh, the one I chose was the best sort of price uh, bang for the buck. Here's the Patagonia one. And I went to REI and this was the one last jacket that was left. So I got the jacket. Um, and my hand to God, three other people come up behind me and they're asking the, the sales rep, Hey, where's this jacket? And she's like, why is everybody all of a sudden looking at this jacket? And every single one of them had read this CNN article. So it, <laughs> so it is a good jacket. And I've had a chance to try it out. The zippers stay completely dry. That's one of my number one requirements. And I use it all the time. So, uh, this is, uh, I haven't tried the other four or five jackets that they mentioned, obviously, but the one, the number one recommended jacket that they talked about was the one I carry now on all my trips. And I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's the business. Um, so that's, that's the one little piece. So one other couple of things I sort of were, were saving till the end in my equipment back, I'm gonna show you now. Uh, okay, so you notice, I was carrying an iPad. 
Uh, it uses, the iPad Pro uses not just USB-C, but it has a Thunderbolt port in it. And this is essential, a, a little, a dongle, unfortunately, but I like this one a lot. I don't know if BNH sells it, but it's by a company called Chargen, C-H-A-R-J-E-N. The reason I like this is because uh, the SD card takes the, all, the super fast, the US, USB, uh, the UHX or something like that too, not the one variant. So it's much faster uh, read speed of the, of the card than any other uh, charger uh, dongle that I've used before. Um, and that's the main reason. It has pass through charging. So, so my uh, one port isn't used. Uh, and because I have so many images, I am now downloading them, most of them to this SanDisk. Again, USB-C, notice everything I have is USB-C. This is a two terabyte drive and this thing is tiny, lightweight SSD. Uh, and the latest version is it does 2000 megabytes per second. The old version did about 1200 or a thousand, but this is really, really good. In fact, I can edit videos from my, my MacBook Pro uh, on the fly directly from this drive. I don't have to first uh, transfer it onto uh, my SSD on the computer. It actually works really great directly from the drive itself. So those are two other essential gear uh, that I take with me uh, whenever I go on the road. Uh, yeah, and so I think we are pretty close. I wanted to leave a little bit of time, uh, 10, 15 minutes or so towards the end for any questions or comments or anything that I haven't gone over about travel landscape photography that you are dying to know about. So let's let's take some questions now if we could. Yeah, let's dive in. I already got my, I went out already and got a headlamp. So there you go. <laughs> during that time, you pulled it up. I'm like, hey, there it is. <laughs> I approve this message. So yes, definitely. Those are great to have. Anytime you're out exploring. Uh, I want to start with a question from Maria joining us from Facebook. She asks, how do you handle storage on the iPad? I know you had the dongle there. What do you do as far as storage is concerned? Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm fortunate to have an iPad that has a one terabyte of storage. So I'm not really running out very much, but I do take a lot of pictures and oftentimes I'm gone for several weeks and that's where I use this particular drive that I just showed, the SanDisk. Um, it, they have various sizes. There's up to four terabytes. That I think is a little dear as far as they're very proud of this. It's, it's quite expensive, I think. But the two terabyte is a perfect balance uh, between price uh, and, and size and performance. And they have, so be, be sure to get the latest version because they still sell two versions of this device. One is at the 1000 megabytes per second and the newest one is up to 2000 megabytes per second. And they get the latest one because it allows you to do editing, 4K editing or videos directly from the drive if you have a Thunderbolt port or, or a fast port. Uh, so I really recommend that version of that drive. Okay. And a question from Javier joining us on Facebook asks if you have anything to say on the Mavic 3 or any drones in general. Do you use them in your workflow? <laughs> uh, I am not much of a drone pilot. I have a, I have a great friend who's, who's great at that. And we tra sometimes travel together and I sort of rely on him. But from what he tells me, in fact, he's already bought it. <laughs> uh, uh, he thinks the fact that the, the, the Mav, I think it's the, it's the Pro 3, it's got a uh, micro four third sensor. It's no longer, the, uh, uh, no longer just a one inch sensor. Uh, it uses Hasselblad uh, lenses uh, and it, it flies for like 40 minutes now. And I've seen some of the footage coming out of that and it's, it's stunning. I mean, especially its ability to do steady images, even at night, uh, that's coming out of that sensor. Uh, personally, I don't do it, but I've seen good friends, people I trust, uh, people I, uh, I have respected, uh, just say that that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's the next great thing. Mm -hmm. Javier, I will say b &H did roll out our new video chat feature on the website. So you can actually chat with a live representative at the store on video, and they can show you drones right there in front of your, your screen. So in addition to our knowledgeable reps, we now have knowledgeable video chat reps 
So you can, that's that, awesome. that way you can see the product a little better. So I do encourage you or anybody else who has a question on that and wants to see, I mean, especially with drones, some of these, especially the, with the Mavics, they have, you know, can be anything from something that's small and folds up in a bag to once you get into the larger drones that you need a Pelican case for, but definitely go on the BNH website and you can speak live with one of our video chat reps. Uh, Mahesh, Estelle is asking about that app, the long exposure app. She wasn't able to yeah. find it on the Android uh, Play Store, on the Google oh, Play Store. Oh, Android. Uh, yeah. iPhone only? <laughs> I, I don't know. You know I've, I've only used it on an iPhone, but I bet you there's something equivalent uh, uh, on the Android App Store that does uh, calculations like that. The most useful feature when I was first starting out about that app um, was its ability to tell me exactly what the ISO shutter speed um, and uh, aperture should be for astrophotography because I didn't have to think anymore. I could sit there and try to figure it out. But if I if I if I have an f four lens, but I still want the same brightness, you know, what should my shutter speed be so I don't get any trails? That's so. Whatever app you decide to get on the Android, make sure it has that ability because everything else you can I think sort of quickly figure out. There are other equivalent things that'll do that. But that was the one unique feature, which I still use uh, when I when I just want to space out and say, OK, uh, this is what I want to achieve. So I'm sorry I can't help you out with the Android, but that is really is a great feature of that app. No, no, no worries at all. Um, Kelvin is asking, what do you equipment do you carry to shoot in the rain, prevent raindrops on your lens? Of course, in addition to the Sony, I mean, it's getting increasingly better with the lens coating, the fluorine. Oh, coating, yeah, yeah, it's stuff. great. But, you know, it's 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 old school, right? Umbrella. <laughs> I carry an umbrella. <laughs> uh, and you know, I, I literally, I am like on the tripod with the camera. The umbrella is deployed on top. That's stopping the rain from hitting the front elements. If it does get on the front elements, then I use this yellow cloth, which is super absorbent. It's feel like one swipe of that front element, it, it, uh, it takes care of the raindrops right away. And it's super cheap. It, you can get it in Costco. It comes in the automotive section, comes in packs of 30 for like 15 bucks, you know, you'll never run out of them. And they're, and they're pretty big. They're pretty big, right? That's what I use. Uh, also, okay. I always carry a lens hood, right? I never leave home without a lens hood. So I always have a lens hood on top of the, uh, in front of my front element. Uh, and unless the rain is coming down sort of at an angle, the lens hood will protect uh, your front elements from rain that's coming down. It's not gonna protect it so much if you're close to a waterfall because that mist is coming in like this. Uh, but most situations, that lens does a really great job. Elizabeth's asking if you ever use fingerless gloves. Elizabeth, you must be watching me out there in the field. That, I wear fingerless yeah. gloves even when it's <laughs> 70 degrees. Mahesh, do you ever use them at all? I have used them. Uh, and I think uh, I think they're great, actually. I, I, I was thinking about the last time I used it. I'm, I'm sort of a, I hate the cold. I hate being cold. And even a couple of fingers being exposed. I've tried the fingerless gloves where you can actually, it has a hood. You can take the hood off the finger. Oh. And then have and expose the finger, uh, and but I've never found a combination of fingerless glove and waterproof <laughs> at the same yeah, I time. Mean, it, it, it's a tough kind. Most of the fingerless <laughs> yeah. gloves, especially the ones I use, it's like no, they're not. They're your fingers are already out. So that I guess and the companies that are making fingerless gloves are like, okay, well you're willing to have your fingers yes, out, exactly. the fingertips out. So why are we going to waterproof it, or why are we going to put anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally so, understand Elizabeth, the reasoning behind it. Do you use fingerless? Elizabeth, I'm sorry we don't have a brand. I I, I live and die by them. I, I oh, love do you? fingerless okay, gloves. Okay, that's great. Because I don't I don't like I don't think I've ever found a glove. I'm gonna have to check these Vessies out because I've check never found out. a glove yeah. that has full coverage that I feel like I can text and navigate my settings. I just don't feel comfortable. I like having my fingertips exposed, even if yeah. They're, so I I, I, I used to feel the same. I used to take my gloves off every time I had to, you know. But this one I can actually text with them. Uh, you know, so. I typically wear uh, a medium, but I got to slice a small. And I think the fact that it's snug uh, and there's mm. no extra cloth around the fingertips allows more precise. That's a pro tip. Yeah. That's a no, pro that's... tip, Mahesh. That's... <laughs> yeah. There, there you go. Yeah. Because you they're guys quite stretchy. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, <laughs> it makes quite perfect stretchy. sense. That now yeah. that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, that's the problem I always have is it's like you got the a little extra, a little a extra piece of, of cloth at the end of the corner. Yeah. yeah. It makes a big difference. Interesting, but you have to have the right materials so that it, 
it stretches enough to stretches. where it's like exactly okay we're, we're putting this together now we're gonna do a workshop on just proper glove wearing right no oh. no it's it's so funny like i am so like i try out everything you know i get i get multiple copies of lenses you know i get uh you know i get like three different or five different dongles just from places that have good return policy like <laughs> like bnh and then <laughs> and, I, and, I, and i find the one that i and i stick with it like that's why it's the equipment i have sometimes it goes on for years and years and i'm not all things that something breaks or i rip something do i like look for something else you know like some of these apps i've been using it for 10 years you know because there may be something better but it works for me exactly look i'm the same way i got yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter my streaming setup. It's like I'll buy an arm from this company and an arm from this company and an arm from this company. You got to see which works best for your use and which yeah. is going to hold up and withstand the test. Exactly. Of time. So, you guys heard it here, right there, from the man himself. I, I think nobody knows product like like Mahesh because you're out there actually testing it and putting those return policies to use. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting back blacklisted, I think, from being an agent. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. We love having you on. Look, we, we're going to have to make this a yearly thing. We're going to have you on. This is perfect timing, right before the holidays. Oh, so yeah, go, right. go out there and tr treat yourselves or treat somebody you know that loves cameras. Yeah, and you know, and it's uh, not just, well, it's like, you know, there's, there's so much stuff out there for photography and videography that's not even camera related. I mean, you could do yeah. talks just on the, you know, okay, what do you have in your car that helps you take better pictures? That in itself is like a, you know, you know like what kind of cores you use? I mean, do you, you know, even I've even gone out and bought like five different adapters for my cigarette lighter thing to see which one gives the most uh, power outlets. It charges my stuff fastest, you know? <laughs> So I get that you, that level of. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one. I'm gonna throw one in, and I'm not a travel yeah. photographer by any means, but I I agree that it's it's all the little things that you don't think about. We think camera, battery, memory cards, and we stop thinking right there. Yeah, a small bean bag. I've used small a small bean bag for it can not only weigh if you have like a little tripod, you can kind of yeah. hook it on the fabric and provide you a little support now i'm not saying a 10 20 pound beanbag yeah but what yeah. i'll use it for is because i hate carrying a tripod so yeah. i will sit a beanbag down on my bag or on a rock and you can kind of mold you can wedge the camera in it and mold it and use it as a tripod so that's my that is great that's a great suggestion day. in fact you know i the funny you should mention that because i travel with my wife so this is the equipment that i carry but i make my wife carry a couple of things too right <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> She's off camera. She's throwing things at you right now. <laughs> she doesn't count as far as, you know, what good. But so what, what I like the beanbag for is oftentimes you'll, you'll go to a place and they won't allow tripods, you know? And so, so a beanbag is perfect. Or uh, when I do some wildlife photography, I'm shooting right from my car. Uh, and that beanbag sits on the windowsill, you know, of the of my of my car perfectly well, and it stabilizes that even if I'm holding it a big lens. Uh, so you're not I don't have this big gimbal setup to do wildlife photography. I just put it on the beanbag, and the beanbag is on top of the of the window uh, door. Wow. That's well, there awesome you go. Way. You guys got two free bonus tips there, and let's take it. Let's take it up a notch since this video is going to be archived online. Let us know in the comments section what you guys' favorite tips or you know hacks for everyday around the house gear that you use for photography drop it in the comment section so that we can keep the goodwill train going and help somebody else out but uh yeah. that's all we got for now so Mahesh this was great man I, like I said we're we're gonna have to have you back I'm not gonna Thanks, wait I'd love to be back it's so season, fun always good having you man great tips uh wonderful photos you guys definitely go check Mahesh's workout and uh, we'll make sure we get them back soon for you guys. And a huge thank you again to not only all of our viewers out there watching, but also Sony for sponsoring this event and Mahesh's last and his future events that we're going to set up right as soon as we finish this. I'll make sure we get to it. But Mahesh, huge thank you again, man. Any closing words? Yes, thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks, B&H. Courtney, always, always a pleasure. And thank you for reaching out and asking me to, to, be, part, to be part of this, this family. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure Courtney reaches out to you very shortly to reschedule you because all right. This is, Have a great day, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. You too. This is another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space in the books. You know the drill. We'll catch y'all next time.